All right. Hello. Good morning, everybody. And we're here today, Saturday morning, for another Teacher for a Day class. Today we have here with us Rafael. Hello, Rafael. Hello. Good morning. Rafael is, our, is Sergio's student from Nova America branch, right? Was Madureira, but it's not. Oh, Madureira. Sorry. Uh, Madureira, your teacher is already here with us. And that's it, Rafael. The, the class is yours. Good luck. Thank you. So, good morning. I'm Rafael from the Madureira branch. And today I'm going to talk a little about radioactivity. I want to broaden your perception of this or add something you don't know about. So, radioactivity. But what is that? Radioactivity is the release of an invisible energy called ionization radiation, which passes through the air, walls, anything, any material from a radioactive material. On our planet, there are 28 natural radioactive elements dispersed in all media. Most of these natural radioactive elements are dispersed in the soil associated with uranium or thorium. So, okay. An invisible energy called ionizing radiation. To better understand, let's know a little about the history of radioactivity. This is a timeline of nuclear science, uh, scientists. I will show you some of them. The principles, not the principles, but the who made the base of chemistry. So, very active uh, phenomenon began to be observed with the discovery of X-ray by William C. Rotigan in 1895. X-ray completely changed medicine in the beginning of the 20th century. You might think, oh, this is normal. But if you stop to think, you see through your own body, it's amazing because you didn't have to open it for it. So, another great observation was from Anthony N. Becquerel, who notes the radiation of uranium emitted in photograph films. This happened in 1896. Together with Becquerel, the Curies studied a uh, uranium called Peckblender. From this, they were able to isolate two elements, polonium and uranium, about 60 or 500 times respectively more radioactive than uranium in 1898. The next scientist we are going to see is Ernest Rutherford. He took a revolutionary a revolutionary step by proposing a nuclear atomic model. But what is an atomic, mo uh, atomic model, nuclear model? He is uh, the Rutherford model of atoms, the last of them. So let's see the current one. It's rep represented by these little balls that you've probably seen somewhere. These models are very important for the advancement of science. So I can't help but look at the current model. This is composed of a central part called the nucleus, where the protons and the neutrons are, and a part around it, which are the electrons. So, but Rutherford went for further. Uh, I can I can show that model 
without a uh, saying no. Okay. No. And with the first to note that some nucleus emit radiation in 1898, he notes two types of radiation, alpha and beta. But I have to say before the Paul Villard discovered the no. Mm. <laughs> oh yeah. Yes, this type of radiation. The Paul Village discovered the third type, gamma rays, this on which the Hulk story is based. This guy discovered the gamma rays. The Rutherford discovered the two types, alpha and beta, and the third was Paul. So in 1900. So in the image, we see low penetration of about the alpha particle medium, beta, and high penetration range in gamma. I think everyone has heard about the Chernobyl nuclear accident. An interesting thing is that this area is affected to these days, as well as the Hiroshima and Nagasaki regions of Japan. This shows that the radiation can last for a long time. So, as you can see, the atoms lose its mass according with the time. In the beginning, 200, uh, 238, and the final, 206. So, each element is different from the other. But the human being has created a way to estimate their time. We estimate the time, the time uh, with half-life of an exhibition. This is the time it takes for the core to have. Maybe you don't understand it very well this part. This health is divided into two parts of equal something. So that's how we discover the age of things. If you wonder how the hell they know how old a dinosaur born is, or what time such a thing was present. This is one way to use radiation knowledge. So, uh, he, uh, Roberto will pass a video to me. Hey there, and welcome to Brain Stuff. I'm Josh Clark, and this is the Brain Stuff where I explain to you how carbon-14 dating works. Carbon-14 dating, which we also just call carbon dating, is a form of radiometric dating. And all it is is measuring the decay of a certain type of atom found in a once-living organism to determine when it was last alive. And all of this starts in the up, up, upper atmosphere of Earth where it's constantly bombarded by cosmic rays. And one of the things these cosmic rays do is knock neutrons off of some atoms and protons off of others. And before you know it, the nice, stable family man, nitrogen-14 atom is all wrapped up and gone crazy and becomes what's known as a carbon-14 atom, which is radioactive. Now, carbon-14 atoms aren't the only ones in the upper atmosphere. There's also carbon-12 atoms. Carbon-12 atoms are in much more abundance, and they're pretty stable. Carbon-14 atoms are, again, radioactive and unstable, but they're formed at a reliable, steady rate. So at any point in time, we have a pretty good idea of the ratio of carbon-12 atoms to carbon-14 atoms. Got that? It's important. Now, carbon dioxide is essential to life here on Earth. Plants breathe it in, animals eat the plants, we eat the animals and the plants. And these carbon molecules, carbon-14 and 12, that make up the carbon dioxide, get in everything. What's neat is that the ratio of carbon-12 to carbon-14 found in all these living things here on Earth is pretty much the same as what's in the atmosphere, which means it's predictable. And some very, very smart scientists have figured out that carbon-14 actually decays at a predictable rate, right? Carbon-14, like all radioactive particles, has what's called a half-life. Now, the half-life is the amount of time it takes for the number of radioactive particles in a sample to decrease by half. Carbon-14 has a half-life of 5,730 years. That means that after 5,730 years, the amount of carbon-14 atoms in a, say, plant 
that you found fossilized will be half of what it was the last time that plant took, well, a breath of life. After 11,460 years, which is two half-lifes, there'll be a quarter the amount of carbon-14 that was originally present. And then after 17,190 years, you'll have just an eighth of the number of carbon-14, and so on and so on, until there's none left. And this is actually one of the limitations of carbon-14 dating, that eventually you're gonna go far enough back in time that all of the carbon-14 atoms have decayed. And you don't know whether this took place a day before or 100,000 years before, which means the time limit that you can date things using carbon-14 is roughly 50,000 years. But as long as you are trying to date something that lived on Earth within the last 50,000 years, you can figure out roughly when it was last alive. And the way that you do that is by measuring the rate of decay of carbon-14 atoms compared to the slow and steady carbon-12 atoms that are also present in there. Presto, change out, you've got some carbon-14 dating, and all of a sudden you say, oh my God, this wooden ax handle is 12,000 years old. Pretty sweet stuff. And this whole thing gets even more interesting when you realize that future archeologists are going to have a lot of trouble using carbon-14 dating thanks to us, humans of the present time. Our industrial activities have been pumping CO2 into the atmosphere and really messing with the ratio of carbon-12 to carbon-14. And even more astounding, all of the nuclear bombs that we set off in the mid 20th century, well, those mess with the atmospheric ratios too. So good luck with all of that future anthropologists and archeologists, sorry. So, how does radi radiation affect our daily lives? Radiation is present in everything. Without any human intervention, it is exists in water on Earth, as I said before, in the air, in our bodies. Yes, our bodies, your bodies, emits radiation. And this is due to the sun, which emits co cosmic radiation. I have uh, other short video to show you some things uh, around us who emitted radiation. Okay, sure. Thanks.
Yes. So before I say of uh, Mahiko here, uh, radioactive elements have been contributing to the improvement of men's life and to the advancement of science and technology. These elements are used to diagnose and treat diseases to combat pests in ag agriculture, preserve food, analyze engineer structures, recall works of art, and sterilize a range of products. From diapers to soft drink bottles, for example. Although we refer to the Chernobyl accident or the atomic bomb, which are bad things. So let's open our minds to all the, that this study bring, brings. A curiosity is that one gram of coal produces energy to keep a 200 watt light bulb is for one minute. One gram of uranium produces enough energy to light a city of 500,000 inhabitants for a one hour. So, now I would like to make an honorable mention to this woman. Obviously, she didn't do uh, she didn't do anything alone. There were a lot of other people, but I want to do this because she was a woman who achieved a lot of and managed to recognize in a time when only men were defeated. So, Marie Curie was a Polish and naturalized French physicist and chemist who conducted pioneering research on radioactivity. She was the first woman to win a Nobel Prize, the first person and the only woman to win the Nobel Prize twice. <laughs> yeah. And the only person to win the Nobel Prize in two scientific fields. Her husband, Pierre Courier, was a co winner on her first Nobel Prize, making them the first ever married couple to the, win the Nobel Prize and launching the Courier family legacy of five Nobel Prize, like I'm showing. Uh, I show I show it before. <laughs> she was in uh, 96 the first woman to become a prof professor at the University of Paris. In 1895, she married the French physicist Pierre Courier, and she shared the 1903 Nobel Prize in Physics with him and with the physicist and Becquerel for their pioneering work developing the theory of radioactivity, a term she coined. Mahi won the 1911 Nobel Prize in Chemistry for her discovery of elements polonium and radium, like I said before too, using techniques she invented for isolation radioactive isotopes. So, so uh, that is my source. Something yeah, about that. I have a lot of work. Yes. <laughs> and this is the end. I I hope you like it. Uh, I committed some mistakes, but uh, <laughs> Rafael, it was I, awesome. Um. I'm in shock with how much radiation is so in our lives, right? That I had, um, I had no idea, like eating Brazil nuts. This is so crazy, right? Radiation seems to be in everything, right? Yes. Um, guys, if you have any questions, please send them um, on the chat. And I have a question for you. Uh, where does this interest in radiation come from? Why do you like it? Why did you decide to teach this topic today? So I didn't have uh, too much time too much time to think because I was uh, like the day to, to say I went to this class was one and I was like uh, five days after. So I have to think 
quickly. And I was in the, when I sent uh, the message, I was having a class of chemistry. <laughs> and uh, I like radioactive was some, nice. some things that I learned. Uh, nice. I want to, to say some, uh, something. Like, I have two thanks for Sergio. He helps me a lot. My teacher of chemistry, uh, Fatima Vaz, helps me too. And Roberta to help me now with the all the technology things. You're welcome. It's a pleasure. And I'm sure Sergio and Fatima are very proud of you right now. Sergio has a question for you here. Uh, would you like to work with chemistry or physics in the future? What career do you intend to pursue? So I don't I I don't know about my future because I it's a lot of things I someone can do like have a lot of work but i'm pretending right now uh do something about um engineer like uh construct uh building oh. a lot of things like uh what's the name of the career yeah it's about uh civil Civil oh, engineer. Civil engineering. All yes, right. Yes. Cool. I was playing uh, that, but I don't know. I I like it. You're still a lot of having things. questions. You're still figuring out what you're gonna do. Yeah, yeah. Lots of interest, right? I know. Um, we have here Miss Isa. She said she knows a lot about Marie Curie because she saw a movie on Netflix, and now I'm curious. I've never watched the movie, and now that you mention her, uh, I got curious. I think I might watch it. Have you watched the series about Chernobyl? I didn't watch, but my brother watched and she talked with me about the series. So I'm planning to watch it. I think it's I, very yeah, good. I liked it very much, very much. It's really interesting and scary as well, right? <laughs> yeah, it's happening. Really really. Interesting. Um, okay, so we have some messages here from people uh, who are happy about your presentation. It was clear and informative. Nasa has learned a lot. Thanks. Uh, Sergio is proud of you. So you got clapping hands. And Josh is here as well. We have lots of people watching you today. Um, do you want to say any, any other comments, anything else to the people who are here with us? No, was that? Uh... Thanks for the opportunity and yes. <laughs> right, Rafael, thank you so much for this class. Thank you for taking part in this project. I learned a lot today and I'm going to search more about radiation because now I'm very curious. And I also want to thank everybody who was here with us. Thank you for being here, uh, for watching Rafael. It was a pleasure being with you. So guys, have a nice Saturday and a nice weekend. Bye-bye everybody. Bye.